Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation you're bringing forth this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We've been sharing with you on the subject of the Holy Spirit and hearing the voice of the Lord. We're going to continue on that, but from another aspect, and then we're going to talk about understanding the anointing of God. It is important that you understand the anointing and how it will work and how to see it come to pass in your life. We begin in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 21. Now he which established us with you, or makes us firm and confirms us, in Christ, and has anointed us, is God. Notice, the anointing comes from God. You can't do anything to be anointed. It's all from God. He's the one who accomplishes it. And we must understand that this anointing begins, and there's many different aspects to the anointing of God, because you must understand what the anointing of God is. It is God manifest in spirit in some way in your life. God manifesting himself in spirit in some way in your life. And for the service of the Lord or for carrying out, doing the, seeing the work be done in your life. We must realize, first of all, we get a beginning of this presence of God, this manifest manifestation of God in our, of course, coming into us when we get born again. And what happens when we get born again? We receive Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior. We get a brand new spirit. What spirit do we get? The spirit of Jesus Christ. We are now in Christ. Notice below, this is the word Christos, which means anointed. So when you get born again, there is an anointing, which is the manifestation of God's presence in some manner, and it begins with you getting a brand new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. Now you have this anointing abiding in you, and that's the beginning of it. And, but also, you're going to get anointing of the Holy Spirit when you receive the Holy Spirit as well. We know that the receiving of the Holy Spirit is after a person is born again. Once you get, first you get born again, you get a brand new spirit, the Spirit of Christ. Then you receive the Holy Spirit, and we have pointed this out. As a believer, in relationship to God as your Heavenly Father, now you receive the Holy Spirit. Luke 11, 13, you then know, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? And this is the word iteo, meaning the demand of something due, which is for those who are believers having a relationship to God as their heavenly Father, having been born again. And so you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is going to come and dwell on the inside of you. And that is a further manifestation of the anointing God manifests as the Holy Spirit comes to dwell on the inside of you. Now, as we look at this, we're going to look in depth about this subject of the anointing. As it's important for you to understand the anointing of God in your life, how it will work and what it will accomplish. Genesis chapter 31 we begin here in verse 13. Here is the first place where we see about this word anointed you, the first use of it. He says, I am the God of Bethel, where thou anointest the pillar, and where thou vowest a vow unto me. Now arise, get thee up out of the, from the land, and return of the land of, my, of the kindred, of thy kindred. Now, this is what he spoke here. It says, I'm the God of Bethel. Bethel means house of God. So what's that speaking of? Well, what's the house of God? The house of God, you and I are the house of God individually and corporately. It's the church who are born again believers in Jesus Christ. And that's where he anoints this pillar. And when we talk about what this pillar is, what is this pillar pointing towards? Well, we know from the New Testament over in 1 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 15, what it's pointing towards. I said, said, if I tarry long, thou mayest know how thou oughtest behave self in the house of God. So that's the house of God, which is the church, remember, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground or the support of the truth. So this pillar that it's speaking of is also speaking of the truth that comes forth in the church. 
the pillar and the ground of the church, of the truth, which is going to come from the place where it's going to be preached. The church is to be preaching the Word of God accurately, boldly. It's got to be in line with, the, of course, the Word. It's got to be correct, no error whatsoever. We go back here to chapter 31, verse 13. So he said, anoint the pillar. It means the place where this word's going to go forth is the anointed place. You know, some people have spoken against the ch having a, a church as such. No, God's the one who set the church. He's the one that set this as the place where the word is to go forth. He's the one who has placed ministry gifts and set those who are going to have the anointing of the ministry gift to bring forth the word of God. There's an anointing upon the church. That's for sure. And this is these the God over the church. That's as long as it's bringing forth the Word of God, of course. That is the big problem. If we don't see that the Word of God is coming forth, then there'll be something wrong. That'll be profane, and it will not be seeing what God wants to bring forth. We go back to Genesis chapter 28. This is why all churches have to come in line with the Word of God. You know, there's many people out there that don't go to church because they haven't been hearing the Word of God. And when they do go, they find it's an entertainment center or uh, they find it's just a social club or whatever, and they're not seeing it be what God had called it to be. It is to be the pillar and the ground of the truth and bring forth the Word. That's the anointing will be there if it's doing that. We see in Genesis 28:18, J Jacob rose up early in the morning, took the stone and the stone would be pointing towards who is the cornerstone, it's Jesus, that he had put for his pillows and set up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. So Jesus is the stone, he's the cornerstone. You and I are living stones in the church. Here it's set up as a pier, this pillar. And notice the oil, this is the word shaman, which is the word for uh, referring to the oil, um, the anointing oil. This is the anointing of God that we be poured on that particular pillar, which is pointing towards the church. And then he goes on and says, he called the name of that place Bethel, the house of God. So again, this is the place where we see the anointing of God that is upon the church, that is bringing forth the truth. Verse 22, this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. What does that tell you? That the tenth that belongs to, to God, that you remember of what he's given unto us, the tenth is his, this is the tithe, is to be given unto him in the church. This is just another scripture that confirms and points out that tithing is for the church. It is for all believers. Anybody that tries to say that you don't, has been deceived and has un misunderstood the truth. The fact is that the tithe belongs to God. It is to be brought to the house of God for the ministry that is going to go forth. Then we see in chapter 35, verse 14, Jacob set up a pillar in the place where he talked with him, even a pillar of stone. He poured a drink offering thereon, and he poured oil thereon. Oil would be this anointing and the drink offering is drink offering always speaks of that which is being poured forth in service. So what this is speaking of is that this pillar, this place which is the church, is to not only have the anointing upon it, but it is to be the place where it's going to be pouring out in the service of the Lord to bring forth everything that God wants. See people get saved, see them get healed, see them get delivered. Reach, reach out to people with the gospel, to preach the gospel, to see people come to the place of receiving Jesus and coming in line with the Word of God. Also, you have to understand that this work is going to be done in you as well through the Word of God, through the anointing that is coming forth from the Word that is being taught, that you would come to the place of becoming a pillar as well in this temple. Revelation 3.12 him that overcometh, that's the one who conquers and carries off the victory. You're to conquer and carry off the victory continually. Will I make a pillar in the temple? And this isn't talking about a building. This is the naos, which is talking about the sanctuary. And that's talking about the ones who are making the sanctuary where God comes to dwell, which are the believers. He's, made us a, he's going to make us a pillar in this sanctuary 
as Young brings out the better translation, of my God. He shall go no more out. I'll write upon him the name of my God, the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, comes down out of heaven from my God. I'll write upon him my new name. That shows you that this anointing that is upon the church, that is bringing forth the word of God, is going to do a work to bring you to the place of overcoming and conquering so that you will become a pillar in this holy sanctuary, this temple of God, and this has effect for you as you are overcoming because it's going to bring you to the place of where we're all headed to the new Jerusalem in the new heavens and the new earth because you have seen this work of God be accomplished in you. The Word is to come into you. It is to do a work in you. It is to bring forth everything that God purposes in your life. We see over in Exodus chapter 25. Exodus 25, we come to verse 3. Here he speaks about the offering that they would take. This is where they were constructing the tabernacle. And they had these offerings that they were bringing forth. And among these things, it brings forth, they spoke of the oil, which is the shaman, which is this anointing, for the light, spices for the anointing oil, and for the sweet incense. So there was this anointing for light, because what is God going to do through the anointing? He's going to bring revelation of the Word of God. That's going to bring forth the light in us. And there's also the anointing oil that they had. And this anointing oil we'll be talking about, that's, for, that's going to bring uh, the work of God accomplished in us. And so this is speaking of the revelation that's going to come forth as we see the the work of God be accomplished in our life. And this construction of the tabernacle is all pointing towards what he does in us. Because the parts of the tabernacle, the labor was the first part, brings the washing. And it's, each part was bringing forth a work of God in each one of our in all our lives to bring us to the place of being that holy temple, the holy tabernacle in the Lord. We come to verse 8. Let them make me a sanctuary. Because this tabernacle is really all pointing towards making a sanctuary for him in you. Make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. This sanctuary is the sacred place, the holy place where you are to become. So the work of God in your life through the anointing, through the word, is going to bring forth the total work of God to bring you to the place of being that sanctuary, that holy place because he's not going to dwell and manifest himself in that which is not holy, that I may dwell among them, settle down, abide, and he will carry out the things. Remember the New Testament? He comes to dwell in us, but he also wants to walk in us and to operate through us as we become that holy sanctuary. So what are you going to do? You're going to build this spiritual house. And we see that this is spoken of many places in Scripture. The building of the spiritual house of God, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, <clears throat> 5, you also as living stones in this spiritual house of God are being built up. This is a work in progress, are being built up, present tense, ongoing action, that means, by God, since it's passive voice, God's doing the work, a spiritual house. You are becoming a spiritual house full of the Word of God, having fruit, having been cleansed, having full, being, coming full of power, and walking in His ways, and seeing the total work of God be accomplished, bringing healing, bringing deliverance, raising you up to be mighty before Him. And that's because of this anointing that's going to bring forth revelation of the ways of the Lord. And that's, of course, what He will accomplish to see this great work accomplished in the body of Christ going forth to the point where it's going to be the glorious, perfected, end-time church. Ephesians 2.21, in whom all the building fitly framed together, you and I are our corporate building in, in process, fitly framed together, groweth unto a holy temple, the naos again, in the Lord. You're being brought to this place. It's through growth. you got to grow up. You grow little by little in the Word of God. You're to grow in grace, you grow in knowledge, you grow in faith, increase in faith. You grow in everything. It's going to be an increase and abounding in your life in all aspects to become a holy temple. 
And then he goes on in verse 22, in whom also you're builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. Meaning that as this building is accomplished and we get builded together corporately, there'll be a mighty habitation of God in this corporate end time church. It's going to see the mighty manifestation of the presence of God is going to be in this end time church. Habitation of God, his abide, but a place of abode where he's going to come and he's going to manifest himself greatly in the end time church. We go back to Exodus chapter 28. In Exodus 28, we look at verse 41. You and I remember we become priests before God. And here he's speaking about how he takes and puts them upon Aaron thy brother, the garments, and his sons with him, and shall anoint them, consecrate them, sanctify them, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. The anointing comes, begins in our life, is pointing to the New Testament day of getting the Spirit of Christ, the new Spirit which the anointing in us, receiving the Holy Spirit who comes to dwell in us. Then the anointed word coming into us is bringing revelation as we're hearing the word of God. And we come to the place that's consecrate also actually means to get filled up, to become full. You and I are going to become full of all the things of the word of God. Every, the total work is going to be accomplished to bring you to the place of being consecrated, sanctified, holy before the Lord. And then, then you'll be able to minister in the priest's office. Otherwise, this work needs to be done for you to be able to minister in the priest's office. And remember, we're all a holy priesthood to minister unto the Lord, and we are a royal priesthood to rule and reign and to carry out the service of the Lord. Of course, we saw that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, where it spoke of the fact that we are a holy priesthood. That we are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, offering up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And then in verse 9, you're a chosen generation, a royal, that's a ruling, reigning, kingly priesthood, a holy nation, because you're going to come to the place of being holy, a peculiar people who, that you should show forth the praise of him has called you out of darkness into the marvelous light, because now we're coming into the light not just by being born again, but through the Word. The Word is going to bring revelation of the light. That's that oil for light. Remember, that anointing is going to bring the revelation of the truth of the Word of God. The anointing is at work to bring that forth by the Holy Spirit who comes to dwell in you. Now we go back to Exodus chapter 29 this time. This is the thing that you shall do unto them to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. And they began then to take these ones, they were going to be for the, for the offerings. And notice after that, they have unleavened bread, they got the cakes unleavened, tempered with oil, that's a shaman, and the wafers unleavened, anointed with oil. And what's unleavened all refer to? No sin. Get rid of all the sin. That means you and I Remember, we, we're the bread, we become the bread of God, or we're part of, he, as we're part of Him, and we get this anointing coming upon us, which is going to bring us to the place of being this wheaten flour that's going to find flour as we come to the place of being righteous and holy before Him with no sin in our life. Otherwise, this is the work of God to bring us to be righteous. Get rid of all uncleanness, get rid of everything that's not of Him, all the unleavened, we have to get rid of it because a little leaven leavens the whole lump, remember. We're going to come. He's bringing you to the place of being righteous and being holy before the Lord. And this is what it speaks of as we speak over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 6, remember it says, this is where they wouldn't deal with the problem in the church with the man who was committing incest with his father's wife. And Paul came to bring the judgment on the, the situation. And he points out in verse 6, Your glory is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. A little sin will contaminate you. A little sin allowed going on in churches will contaminate the church as well. And then it will shut down the anointing and stop the work of God from being accomplished. And they weren't doing what was right. So he said, Purge out, cleanse out thoroughly the old leaven. 
You've got to cleanse it out that you might be a new lump. This isn't a brand new lump in the sense like when you get born again. This is talking about this work. You become recently new because you get all this old stuff, evil stuff out of you and you get restored back to what you're to be. You're to be as a new one walking in the ways of the Lord, holy and righteous before him. As you're unleavened, even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, this is how we keep the feast in the New Testament era. Remember, we don't keep the Old Testament feasts in any physical manner. It's all the spiritual application of the work of God being done in us. And the way you would keep the unleavened bread feast, which is getting rid of all the sin. They got all the leaven out of the house. You get all the sin out of you, the spiritual house of God. So we're going to keep it. But not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity, which refers to purity, purity, and sincerity, and come into the place of also in the truth. You're going to become pure. You're going to be a person of truth. You're going to walk in the ways of the Lord, and you're going to see this work be accomplished because every one of us has to see unleavened all the leaven has to get rid of and all the leaven has to come out of us being purged out as we said so that we come to the place of being unleavened. Cleanse out thoroughly. Everything's got to be cleansed out of your life if you're going to see the anointing of God manifest and continue to work in you and bring you to what he has for you. The anointing will be working to bring you to that place so you come to the place of repentance and do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Exodus. Through, it'll be through the word that's going to bring you to that. 29, we go back to 29, verse 7 this time. Thou shalt take the anointing oil and pour it upon his head and anoint him. And so the anointing poured upon the head. Well, the head would speak of the fact that what's, what's our head? The head's got the mind in it. The anointing's going to come upon you in your mind because what's it going to do? It's going to bring the revelation of the Word of God to you so you begin to develop the mind of Christ in you. And then we see on verse 21 where he talks about take the blood of the, upon the altar, the anointing oil, sprinkle it upon Aaron, upon his garments, upon his sons, garments of his sons with him. He'll be hallowed, his garments, his sons, and his sons' garments with him. Because what else is supposed to happen? The blood's to be applied. Remember the blood was applied uh, to the tip of the right ear, the right thumb, great uh, th thumb of the right hand, and then the great toe of the right foot, which all speaks of what? Cleansing. Cleansing. All your members, what you hear, what you put your hands to, your walk, what you've been walking after. So here we see the fact that this anointing is going to get your mind renewed to the Word of God and bring forth this cleansing. You're to get totally cleansed so that you come to the place of being holy before him and you put the garments of God on. You got to put the garments of God on to come to this place. There will not, you will not see an increased anointing in your life without putting the garments of God on. These are holy garments that were put on. Well, what do we do over in the New Testament? We're going to put on the garments of God as well. These are the spiritual garments. There's many aspects of the anointing coming in your life because remember, it is God manifest in spirit in some manner, in some way in your life. And here we're talking about this work of seeing the garments being put on in our life. Either Ephesians 4.24, that you are to put on. Anything that you're to put on would be like putting on these garments, clothing yourself with something. They had to clothe themselves with the holy garments. You and I must do that as well for that anointing to operate. You're going to clothe yourself with, in duo, you're responsible to do it, remember, because it's a, command, it's, it's a middle voice here, meaning that you're to do this for your benefit. And what are you putting on? The new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Well, that means again, righteousness, because of the fruits of righteousness, because you're a doer of the word of righteousness, and because of coming to the place of holiness, Holiness will be the result of the fruits of righteousness produces holiness in your life. We also see over in Colossians, this putting on is essential to see the anointing come forth in your life. Colossians chapter 3, verse 10, that you put on the new man. And how? By being renewed in knowledge. 
that's where the, that word coming into your mind, renewing you. So you develop the mind of Christ after the image of him that created him. And then we come down to verse 12, put on. Not only do you put on this new man in, of the renewed knowledge in your mind, but also you put on other things because you're putting on the garments of God that are going to cover all areas of your life. Put on here, same thing. And this time it's a command, but you're to do it for yourself since it's middle voice. Therefore, as the elect of God, one who's been chosen, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. These are all talking about fruits of the Spirit, and things that are to come on you. And you're also to be forbearing one another, forgiving one another, so you don't have any negative attitudes towards anybody. You don't have any sin against anybody. If any man have a quarrel against thee, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. And above all these things, you put on charity, brotherly love, which is the bond of perfectness. How are you going to come to perfection? only when you put all these things on. How are you going to see the anointing manifest in your life? It's only when you come to, by putting all these things on. It's going to bring you and I to perfection for the great anointing that's going to come upon this end time church that walks in his ways. What else do we put on? You're going to put on the armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, put on. That's to clothe yourself Again, a command, your responsibility to do it, since it's a middle voice, you do it for your benefit. You clothe yourself with the whole armor of God, which is the word in you in all aspects. The word in your heart, the word in your mind, the word directing your steps, the word that you're going to be thinking upon and using to speak against the enemies, to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. You're going to use to smite the enemies. The word in ap application in all areas of your life that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You will be able to stand against all his attacks as you put all these things on. It is absolutely essential. You also are going to be putting on, here, having on, it says, and this means in duo again, putting on the breastplate of righteousness. Again, it all comes to be righteous. Only those who are righteous will be able to be right with God and anointed. You have a new spirit righteous spirit, but you put on this breastplate of righteousness through the word in your heart that produces the fruits of righteousness as you hear and do the word, so that you will be righteous before the Lord. And also, as you're putting on these garments, the reason why it's going to bring the manifestation of the anointing is because you are essentially doing what this says, kind of a summation of it all, Romans 13:14. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You're becoming like Him. You got all the things with the Word in you, it produces the fruit. You got the Word in you, it produces the power of God. You got the Word in you that's, that's clothing you with the, the mind of Christ, getting a brand new you know, mind renewed and true, all the different fruit that it spoke of. You're putting on all these things. You're putting on for yourself. And this also, by the way, this is a command to you and me. You're, you and I are commanded we're responsible to do it, middle voice, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the Word of God put on like garments being put on you that you become like Him. And you make not provision or forethought for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. It is mandatory, remember, that you crucify the flesh daily, you put off the deeds of the body, you mortify the deeds of the body, you cannot be giving place to the flesh and think that you're going to see the anointing of God, it's not going to work whatsoever. We must turn away from all that is not of Him. We also see over in another place, this is also important because remember, where are we headed to? We saw that, that, we're, that when we become the pillar, remember, where are we going to be a pillar in? It's going to be in the New Jerusalem, isn't it? It's going to be the end result because we've conquered it, overcome. Well, that's, that's what this is pointing towards as well. Matthew 22, 11, this is the wedding. And that speaks of the wedding with the Lord. The wedding supper, who's going, to be in, who's going to be able to be there? The king came in to see the guests. He saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. He hadn't clothed himself with the wedding garment. What a mistake. He's supposed to do it for himself. 
but it was supposed to have already been done at this point because you and I are supposed to do it now and keep it on. The reason is because that's a perfect tense, which means completed action in the past with present results at the time of speaking, meaning from this standpoint, the king's coming in to see this guy who thinks he's coming to the wedding and he's supposed to have already put this on, this wedding garment of righteousness and holiness and seen this total work of putting on the Lord Jesus Christ in his life. It's supposed to have already been on and been continuing on is his lifestyle. He didn't have it on. He's in trouble. Is that person going to be in the New Jerusalem and then this wedding and come through all these things? No. He said, he didn't say friend, he said comrade is what this word means. Comrade. He's just speaking to him as a, a person. How camest thou in thither, hither not having a wedding garment? He was speechless. What'd they do with him? Bind him hand and foot, take him away and cast him into outer darkness. They'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's because he didn't do what he was supposed to do. This means this anointing has come into your life not just for good things to happen whenever I want to see something happen. No. It's to do the total work of God in your life. And you must let it happen. You're commanded to do all these things, see. That's why it says many are called, but only few are chosen. The ones who put on all these things. The ones who deal properly with the reason why, why this anointing has come to you to accomplish the great work of God in your life. Those are the ones that are going to be chosen. And that means we can't be having any defilement because when we come down to looking at the judgment on the church in Revelation chapter 3, 2 and 3, remember, here's the one at Sardis. Verse 4, he says, Thou hast a few names in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. They shall walk with me in white for they're worthy. You can't have defiled garments and think you're going to make it. <laughs> and you're not gonna, it's not going to happen. You've got to be holy before the Lord. Defiled garments got to be eliminated. And even in the time when the judgments are coming forth, in Revelation 16, verse 15, it speaks. When Jesus is coming, look what he says. Behold, I come as a thief. That means suddenly. And then he's talking about who is going to, who is going to be there that he's going to be caught up to meet him in the air that he's coming for. Blessed is he that's been watching and keeping his garments. Otherwise, he makes sure he has the garments of God on. He's staying righteous and holy. Lest he walk naked, well, that means he's not clothed. If you walk naked, that means you don't have the garments of God on which means you're going to be walking in the flesh or walking in sin or you're not walking with the mind of Christ. You're not, not walking in the fruit of the Spirit. You're not walking in righteousness and holiness whatsoever. And what would happen? They see a shame. Who's they? They're the bad guys that are going to be used of the devil to try to bring destruction against all those who are not going to be protected. And you won't be protected if you, they're seeing your shame because you're naked. In other words, you must be watching and you must be keeping and guarding your garments at all times to maintain being righteous, holy, having the Lord Jesus Christ on so that then you will be chosen because you responded to the call of God. That's how important this is. And we must not let anything get a hold of us. That's why you've you got to get rid of all the works of the flesh. You need to come to the place of hating the, any works of the flesh to get upon you. Jude 23, others, this is what we reach out for others, to save with fear, the fear of the Lord, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Remember, he's coming back for a church without spot, without wrinkle. If you're spotted by the flesh, you're contaminated. You need to hate any spots, wrinkles, anything that's not of God. You need to root it out of your life. We should hate that. And you're spotted by what? But by the flesh. Any work of the flesh. This is why we must not yield to anything that is of the flesh. So the anointing is going to be accomplished through the Word in you, putting on the holy garments of God that will result in you being filled up with the things of God, consecrated, ready for the service of the Lord, fulfilling and completing all the things that God purposes for you in your life. We just go back to Exodus 29 now. 
was progressively seeing the work of the anointing. Verse 36. Here he says, Thou shalt offer every day a bullock for a sin offering for atonement. Thou shalt cleanse the altar when thou hast made an atonement for it, and thou shalt anoint it and sanctify it. Talking about the altar. Well, the altar is the place where they would offer up their sacrifices. Do we offer up sacrifices today? Yes, we do. Not physical sacrifice, but spiritual sacrifices. And what's the altar speak of now? It's your heart. Your heart is going to offer up the spiritual sacrifices as you are ministering unto the Lord and ministering for Him. Therefore, you got to have a cleansed heart. You can't let any contamination come into your heart. you got to have your heart right before the Lord. You've got to cleanse it. And so then it'll be anointed and it'll be shown to be holy before God. Absolutely essential that we have a cleansed heart. And of course, this involves also what's entrance into your heart? All your faculties. And that would especially mean your soulish realm because you've got to clean up in the soul realm as well. We've got to get all this filth out of us. Because look what he says in 1 Peter 1.22. Seeing you have purified your souls. How does it happen? In obeying the truth. Because you do what the word says. You're going to clean up the soul realm. Through the spirit. And unfeigned love of the brethren. See that you love one another with a pure heart. Fervently. As you purify your soul. It will also bring this purification in your heart because you're cleaning up everything and you're going to guard your heart, remember, and not let any evil come into it. We also see we're told to cleanse our heart. Here it says in James chapter 4, verse 8, Draw an eye to God, he'll draw an eye to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. We've got to get rid of the, anything that's not. And when it says double-minded, that's kind of misleading because it's actually the word disukos. Sukos is the word for soul, so that's two-souled. Well, that means anything that's coming into your soul that's contrary to the word is going to cause you to be two-souled, double-souled. Of course, that's why, where's the word written? It's written in your heart and it's written in your mind to affect your soul. So you've got to get the mind of Christ established in you and it will come, of course, as the Holy Spirit is bringing revelation. Remember, He writes it in your heart and mind. He brings revelation. You hear it. You do it. You bring, bring forth fruit. You continue. You bring forth more fruit. You go through the cleansing process. And then you come to the abiding place of bringing forth much fruit. To have, we are to have a pure, clean heart before the Lord. So the anointing of God was also to sanctify the altar, which speaks about your heart. You've got to have your heart right. How can you have an anointing in your life if your heart's not right? You can't have any evil in your heart or doubt in your heart or unbelief in your heart or any of these kind of things. You've got to have your heart right before the Lord. It's absolutely mandatory. Now we go to another part in Exodus. Exodus chapter 30. Verse 23 and following. And here we see about the holy anointing oil. Verse 23, Take thou also unto thee principal spices, a pure myrrh, 500 shekels, sweet cinnamon, half as much, 250 shekels, and of sweet calamus, 250 shekels, of cassia, 500 shekels, and after the shekel of the sanctuary, and of olive oil and hin. Here it's speaking of these five things that make up this holy anointing oil. The first one here it speaks of is... The, the pure, mur, 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 pure, and it's interesting, pure myrrh, the pure really means a liberty flowing free myrrh, meaning that this aspect of the anointing is going to bring liberty. It's going to bring so you can be flowing and be a vessel for God to operate through you. And this really speaks of liberty. Liberty, the anointing will bring liberty to you in your life. It will bring forth a purifying and a change in you. We even see in, over in, in um, Psalms 45. Verse 8. All thy garments, and this is all pointing towards Jesus because it's talking about 
his throne, the scepter of his kingdom. This is all what it speaks of in Hebrews 1, 8, and 9. When it talks about when he's enthroned in his kingdom, it's all pointing towards that. Loves righteousness, hates wickedness. He's anointed with thee because the oil of gladness above thy fellows. By the way, in order to see this anointing of the oil of gladness, you've got to love righteousness and hate wickedness. You should hate anything that's wicked. Otherwise, that'll stop. That'll stop the anointing of gladness, the oil of gladness upon you. All thy garments, everything. They smelled of myrrh and aloes and cancer out of the ivory places where they made thee glad. That speaks of these are garments then that are put on because the garments of God are going to bring the fragrance of the Lord in your life, the manifestation of that anointing. And that's this, his garments will smell of the myrrh, as it's pointing out. And so here, this of course speaks of Jesus being brought forth in us because you're to become like him. You're to be purified just like him, remember. In fact, we've seen that before, some time back, John chapter 3, where it says, Now where the sons of God has not yet appear what he shall be, but we know that when he shall appear will be like him. Why? Because the work's been done in you. For we shall see him as he is. Every man that has this hope in him to be like him purifies himself. Otherwise, you have to purify yourself to be like him. You're not going to be like him if you have all the sin in your life and not walking in the ways of the Lord. So we're going to come to the place of being purified. And we even see this, referring to this merge, points out this was used about in pur purification in Esther chapter 2 in verse 12 for those ones who were all the women that were going to present themselves before the king to see who he'd select to be the queen. Esther 2.12, every maid's, maid's turn was come to come to go into King Ahasuerus, who the 12 months, according to the manner of the women, they were the days of their purifications accomplished. That is six months with the oil of myrrh. It was to bring purification. That shows you that this is speaking of the purification of God being accomplished in your life to bring you to the place of being one who is pure, and holy so that then you can have liberty to see God be operating in your life. These are, of course, these are the garments, the garments that are on Jesus. And remember, this myrrh was one of the things that was presented unto Jesus, one of the gifts that was presented to him in Matthew chapter 2, verse 11. When they came into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother, fell down, worshiped him, opened their treasures, they presented him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, that was for that anointing, see? The anointing that was going to come. Myrrh is one of the gifts, and this is to be the same thing as to be on the garments of us, having the holy garments of a king. So these are the, this is what was given to the king, this is what's to be in you, so you and I are a king as well. We are to becoming kings. So this really speaks of the purifying work being accomplished for liberty and to bring you to the place of being as a king because you got the garments of God on. You got the holy garments that are going to be on you. We go back over to Exodus. The anointing, all these point towards a work being done, see, in your life, or being a work being done through you. So this is the myrrh. The second one was the sweet cinnamon. This comes from the inner bark of an evergreen. We looked this up in Bible dictionaries. And what happened was uh, that in some of the Bible dictionaries, it speaks of how be, the oil became fine, the finer oil, when it was boiled from but the ripe fruit. Meaning, when there's the fruit that is ripened, then that's how it, then they would boil this and it would become this fine oil that they would use in this. And so, and also, Jesenius, who is a Hebrew scholar, points out that this comes from a root, a particular Hebrew root, which means the idea of standing upright. Standing upright. Well, that speaks of you and I are going to be standing upright when? When we have the ripe fruit. The ripe fruit in our life, which the oil would be manifest 
of boiling this ripe fruit. That's how when they were making this particular um, anointing oil, they would do this. So this again, this, now this speaks of being upright and being fruitful. As you're upright and you're fruitful, the anointing will be there because the work of God has been done in your life. You're being changed into His image. You're being walking His ways. You're bringing forth fruit in your life. Then we have another one, and that is this uh, one, the calamus, the sweet calamus. And in the Bible dictionary, when you look at this, is referring to this is a plant that grows in Lebanon, a reed-like plant, grows in mires, easily bruised. But when it's ground into powder, the sweet-smelling oil produces, it brings forth healing, and it would kill roots of disease. So that means this anointing that comes into you because of this work being done is going to be bringing forth healing. It can bring forth healing in you. It also will bring forth healing through you to go and minister to others as well. This would speak of ministering healing. Healing coming to you as well as being able to minister healing to others. And then the next one is the word the cassia here. And this was powdered bark like cinnamon. It was used in scenting garments. And it's interesting that this word comes from a word here which means to bow down, which means what? Worship. So what is this speaking of? This is all pointing towards those who worship God. That's also going to be another part of how the anointing comes forth, because all these things are showing you how the anointing comes forth. The purifying of the mirror, the becoming upright and being fruitful of the cinnamon. We see of the, in the, the calamus is the healing that is going to come. And then we see in the casea here, the worship, one who's a worshiper, people that won't praise and worship God, are they gonna have an anointing in their life? No, you need to minister unto him, so then he will minister back unto you. Worship will bring a manifestation of the anointing in your life. And that is what, of course, God wants to see, as we even see an example of where it brought the anointing that brought revelation of what they were supposed to do in Acts chapter 13. And they were seeking what they were supposed to do. They ministered to the Lord, praising and worshiping Him, and fasted. Because they did that, then they're going to now hear the anointing of the Holy Spirit manifests, and the Holy Spirit said, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I've called them. Worship and praise and worship, oftentimes will, God will speak to you in the midst of that or having done that to give you a revelation of what He wants you to do because you've ministered unto Him. And that's what happened in this case. So this speaks of praise and worship as well. And then we go back to Exodus chapter 30. These, all these ingredients speak of point towards the things that you and I are to do to see the anointing manifest in our life. And then there was the oil, this is the shaman, oil, olive, and hen. So this again, this is the oil, and what was the purpose for the oil? The oil was for light, as we saw, which is illumination, revelation, that he's going to bring forth. We even see in Exodus 27, verse 20, it's pointing towards this. You command the children of Israel that they bring the pure olive oil beaten here, or grounded up, pounded here, for the light to cause the lamp to burn always. And otherwise, when they took this olive oil and they put it in the lamp, it would bring the light because it's gonna bring the anointing. And what's gonna happen when you get the light in you, it's gonna burn always. Remember that they had the thing burning continually? What's that pointing towards? Do you just want to just have some light stand, you know, in your house burning always and think that that's the fulfillment of it? No. That's all the Old Testament stuff. It's all pointing towards the realities. Who's the lamp? You and I are. The light is to come into us and it's to be burning and light always. The light's to be burning in you always is what this is speaking of because of the anointing that brings revelation. The light comes into you. The light of the knowledge of the Word of God, and it's going to cause you to be burning always, to be lightened always. And that's what God wants for every single one of us. 
And that's what the anointing will do. Now you can shut down the anointing in your life as well by disobedience. Here we see this in Deuteronomy 28, verse 40. This is in the midst of when it, the first 14 verses are the blessings coming on you if you hearken diligently on the voice of the Lord your God. Verse 15 and following talks about if you don't hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, then all these curses will come on you. And here is one of them. Thou shalt have olive trees throughout all thy coast, but thou shalt not anoint thyself with the oil, that you won't have any anointing, for thine oil of olive oil shall cast her fruit. Otherwise, there'll be no anointing on your life if you are in disobedience, because this is in the midst of all the curses that come because of disobedience. Disobedience will shut down the anointing in your life. We must be obedient. So the anointing oil is is it's like the fragrance of God coming upon you because you've met all the conditions for Him to operate through you. It's going to flow freely in us as we come to the place of being purified. As we're obedient, we get the Word in us, remember? And we have put on these garments. We get become holy, kingly garments as kings. And then it's going to bring forth healing in us and release healing, of course, through us and deliverance at the same time. We're also going to get revelation knowledge through the Word of God that's going to come into us. And we're also going to come be worshipers of God as we minister to Him. He's going to minister back unto us. This is why offering the sacrifice of praise continually, the fruit of your lips is, is, is essential in your life. You need to be praising Him and worshiping continually. The people that won't enter into praise and worship, they're not going to see any anointing operating in their life whatsoever. This will shut it down if you don't walk in obedience to Him. We go back to Exodus 30. And we come, after having all these parts on, the purification, again, what these were, the purification, the being upright, being fruitful, because you're now walking in the ways of the Lord, the fact that you, the healing has come forth in your life and deliverance to bring forth freedom and liberty. You're a worshiper of God and you've come to get light and revelation of the Word of God in you that's bringing you to the place now. You're going to walk in the light of the Word of God. What's going to happen? You're going to anoint the tabernacle of the congregation. This is the, the meeting place. The appointed place of the meeting place here, therewith, and the Ark of the Testimony. Otherwise, now who the tabernacle is what now today? You and I are the tabernacle. We're the temple of God. The temple of the meeting, the congregation, or the meeting place therewith, because He's going to come and manifest Himself in you. And it's going to be through the anointing that is going to manifest in your life. It's going to accomplish the total work in you and through you. Otherwise, you've got to have the anointing of God in your life if you're going to see Him do things through you. Many people just try to do things in the flesh and they're going nowhere. Many people can have false anointings because they have gotten involved in wrong things or they have wrong doctrine they can bring forth. There's not, they're false anointings. They'll sometimes they'll appear to be one, but it's not the real deal. It is deception and it will lead people down a wrong path. The table, the vessels, the candlestick, the vessels, everything was supposed to be anointed in this. The burnt offering of all his vessels, the labor and his foot, the entire, everything was to be anointed in it. It would be sanctified that it might be most holy. The bottom line is the anointing is going to bring you to holiness. And when God, he's a holy God, and the holy God is going to manifest himself in a mighty way to accomplish not only a great work in you, but also through you to see God accomplish everything that he, pur par that he purposes. And it will set you apart. This, when they anoint Aaron and sons, they consecrated them, which means to really to set them apart, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office. You have, need to have the anointing so you can minister to him, and you're a priest. Therefore, the anointing has to work in your life. It starts out with getting the brand new spirit, the spirit of Christ. Then you receive the Holy Spirit, who's now going to bring revelation to you. You're going through this purification process. You're coming to the place of bringing forth fruit, you're being sanctified. You're being coming up upright before Him. You're seeing the healing and deliverance come forth in your life to set you free, bring you to the place of liberty. And you're coming to the place of you're a worshiper of God. 
and this anointing has brought the revelation to you. You put on the garments of God, all these things. You become like Jesus. That's how the anointing is going to work in your life and bring you to that place of what he purposes. Now, notice he goes on. He says, you'll speak unto the children of Israel, saying, Thou shalt be a, this shall be a holy anointing oil unto me throughout your generations. See, something in the natural isn't going to do it. That's just all types pointing towards the reality. See, everything you see in the Old Testament is pointing towards the reality in the realm of the Spirit that's to happen to us now. Now, one thing you have to realize, though, look at the next part. Upon man's flesh shall it not be poured. Can anointing be upon anybody who's in the flesh? No, it will not. Anybody that's not operating in spirit will not have an anointing. It cannot be poured on man's flesh, which is pointing out anybody that's operating in carnal ways, carnal mind, operating the flesh, walking in things contrary to the word, there will not be an anointing. You can't duplicate it and make it yourself or do anything you can to cause it to happen. It's all God. And it's only when you meet the conditions that it's going to be able to be accomplished. So anything in the flesh, it's not anointed. People that operate in the flesh, it's all a counterfeit anointing. And it can be demonic spirits are operating through them and a false anointing. Been false anointings on people out there that have deceived people. It's not been God whatsoever. Of course, it's always got to be in line with the Word of God. Furthermore, whosoever compoundeth any like it, or whosoever puts any of it upon a stranger, shall be cut off from his people. You try to compound something like it and ma make your own anointing, you're going to be cut off. It's only by God. All the things that He says is the only way. There's no other way. And also, if you try to put it on a stranger, that means someone's not born again, someone's not right with God. You're going to be cut off. Can we anoint and do the works of God, minister healing or deliverance to people that are, not, that are strangers, that are not right? No, you've got to spiritually locate them first. You've got to be sure they're born again first. You've got to be sure they're right with God. You can't go ministering healing or deliverance to someone and they're living in fornication with someone or they're, they're you know, walking in the ways of the world or sin. It's not going to happen. Otherwise, you can't put it on a stranger or someone who is, not, who is a, an enemy as such or a foreigner. You can even mean someone who's an enemy. And that'd be any, anybody in the walk in the world. Maybe if you're walking the world, you're a spiritual adulterer and adulteress and you set yourself as an enemy against God. In other words, the anointing is only for those who are right with God. Those are the only ones that are to be ministered unto. So that means we don't cast out demons and minister healing to people out there that are not right with God. It's a covenant right that belongs to them and you just don't give the anointing. That's the same reason why you just don't, don't, just don't bless anybody, you know. You don't bless someone that's that's not walking in the way, let's say they're, they're in, walking in some false religion and stuff, and you're going to say, oh, God bless you to them. See, words release things. You don't do that. We've already talked about that in the past. You don't go blessing things that are not of God. You've got to be right with Him. Or it even says you be cut off. It'll bring a judgment, certainly, against people if they will not come to the place of doing what's right. You only minister to people that are right with God met the conditions, see. Exodus 40, verse 9. Thou shalt take the anointing oil, anoint the tabernacle, and all this therein shall hallow it, and all the vessels thereof, it shall be holy. They were constantly talking about this anointing, anointing everything in the tabernacle, anointing everything. Everything of God has to be anointed. What does that speak of? Well, that speaks of everything that you would do that involves not only you, but also involves the church. Everything has to be anointed in line with the Word. That's why we praise and worship God. We bring forth the Word. Would jokes be a, have an anointing upon them? No. Would opinions have an anointing upon them? No. Would the party spirit, you know, and the feel good and, you know, have a, how about the worldly music coming in? No way. There's no anointing on that. It's a bunch of clamor and noise that's from the, it's bringing devils into us. What it does, it brings a false anointing that comes in. And this is in a lot of places, unfortunately, because they're making a great mistake. And also, you know, we anoint the tabernacle. Now, does that mean I run around anointing a building? No. 
knowing that the building is going to do something. If you're doing the building, but yeah, you're doing all these evil things, is it going to be anointed? No. The tabernacle is who today? The temple, who is us. The anointing's got to be in you. I've seen people run around they want to, you know, in places they wanted to anoint all these places, you know, and stuff like that. And yet the people aren't walking right themselves. It's, it's not going to do anything. You think something the natural is going to cause the anointing to be there if you haven't met the conditions and you're not walking right? No way. It's all a bunch of carnality. Everything's in the spirit now, remember, in the New Testament. And so what we were supposed to not anoint everything that is of God. That's why they would anoint here the, the altar, and they, which is type of the heart. They would also anoint the laver. The laver was the place where there was all the washing that was going forth, the cleansing. See, this is all the work of God to be done in you and also in the church. That's why, what are we doing? We're ministering the word. We're ministering healing and deliverance to bring the cleansing. Ministering everything that's going to bring forth what is profitable to someone. Uh, you know, you're not going to bring things that aren't of God whatsoever. So this is all, this washing, had to, this is the washing with water. They did this. This is all part of what this anointing was for. And they put them on the holy garments, anointed him, sanctified him so he could minister. So first you get the holy garments. The result is you got the anointing, the sanctified work, and then you can minister to the Lord. You can't put the cart before the horse and think that I can go and minister if I don't have the holy garments on. No way. And am I going to be anointed if I don't have the holy garments on? No. Am I going to be sanctified? No. Am I going to be ready and allow for, for God to operate and minister through you? No. It'll just be all in the flesh. Verse 15. Thou shalt anoint them as thou didst anoint their father, that they may minister unto me in the priest's office, for the anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. And you and I now are priests, and we're to operate as priests with the anointing of God. Many people, well, yeah, I'm born again, I've, I've come into the priesthood, but they haven't done what's necessary to see the anointing of God operating in their life for the service of the Lord. If you've not got the mind of Christ, if you haven't put on the garments of God, if you're not a praiser and worshiper, if you haven't gone through the cleansing process, if you've not come to the place of, of walking uprightly before the Lord, if you haven't got revelation of the ways of the Lord, if you haven't you know, purified your heart and your soul, all these things are absolutely necessary to come to the place of being a holy vessel before the Lord. And that includes, remember, our, our body. Remember, this body you have is a body of, of sin, what am I supposed to do with my body? You're still, still to present it as a holy vessel. Romans 12, 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God. You don't let anything come into your body that's not of God, even though sin dwells in it. That's why you mortify the deeds of the body. That's why you got to Make sure that you get your mind renewed so that you're choosing to do what God wants. Remember, with the mind, you'll serve the law of God, but with the flesh, you'll serve the law of sin. You cannot walk in the flesh. You can't even have forethought for the flesh. If you're operating in any sin or any, anything of, of the flesh, you're going to be unclean. You're going to be leavened. You're not going to see the anointing of God come forth in your life. It's mandatory. People want to see the anointing of God work, the presence of God, and they wonder why it's not. Well, if we haven't met the conditions, it won't. Or else they have false anointings that have come from false things that they've been involved in. And we see that all over the place. Leviticus 2.4, If thou bring an oblation of a meat offering baked in the oven, it shall be unleavened cakes of fine flour mingled with the oil. Ah, that's that anointing that's worked. Or the unleavened wafers anointed with the oil. Same thing, offering is going to come from vessels without sin and are also going to be anointed of God. Now, verse 3, If the oblation be a meat offering baked in a pan, it shall be a fine flour unleavened mingled with oil. And so, again, you see the same thing. Every time they're offering, it always had something to do with unleavened and mingled with the oil, the anointing, because they're unleavened. You cannot have anything anointed if you have leaven. It's not going to happen. This is why sin has to go. 
if the priest that's anointed do sin, well, he was anointed, now he sinned. According to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering. He's got to deal with that because he just affected that, shut, shut down that anointing in his life because of the sin. Now, can you be cleansed in the New Testament? Of course, if you repent, get right. Can you have the anointing manifest again? Yes, of course, if you get yourself right and start walking in the ways of the Lord. If you abide in that sin and you don't deal with it, are you going to have an anointing? No. In fact, you'll probably end up having a false anointing because you'll try to go and minister not having dealt with it properly and the devil will be operating through you and can deceive you and lead you down a wrong path. Leviticus 21, 12. Neither shall you go out of the sanctuary nor profane the sanctuary of God for the crown of the anointing oil. This is the word crown here that refers to the separation, which is also the word here about for Nazarite, that speaks of the Nazarite, who is the one who is consecrated and separated unto God. For the crown of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. That, this is the word for the consecration, the separation of the Nazarite ship. And remember, the Nazarites were those that they had to get rid of all sin. They couldn't drink any alcohol. They couldn't have anything. You can't have anything that's profane. Otherwise, you're going to be profane. You can't go near unclean or profane things whatsoever, or you won't be anointed. It'll be a false anointing. It will do nothing. In fact, if anything, you let devils operate through you. This is why we see people they may not be trying to do evil things, but evil things can come through them because they're not a holy vessel. They're not an anointed vessel. And they can have a transfer of spirits because they haven't dealt with themselves properly. That's why you always remember, watch who, you lay, who lays hands on you or tries to minister to you. You want to be sure that they're right before the Lord. Numbers, chapter 6. See, this is God's anointing. It's holy. It's not going to operate when you want it to. It's only going to operate when you meet the conditions. That's for sure. Number 6, verse 13. This is the law of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are fulfilled, he should be brought in the door of the tabernacle of the congrega congregation, offers offering here, without blemish, just burn off all these different offerings that it would offer up. Basket of unleavened bread, no sin. Cakes of fine flour mingled with oil. The anointing has worked to bring him to the place of being like fine flour, being righteous. Wafers of unleavened bread anointed with oil. Their meat offering. And this is your gift unto God, of, really of yourself being holy. And their drink offering, which is pouring out of service. That was all this is about. That was what this Nazarite was all about to get themselves to the place where they would be ready for the service of the Lord and they would carry it out. It's also interesting what it says over in Ruth, chapter 3. In Ruth, if you remember about Ruth, Ruth was coming to Boaz for a marriage proposal, which is all a type of man who's coming to Jesus and got to be right in order to, for him to accept this marriage proposal for the marriage of the Lamb, remember? So what do you have to do? This is what Naomi told her. Wash yourself, therefore. You've got to get washed and clean for the marriage. Anoint you. You're supposed to be anointed, which is going to be through all these things, the purification, the word in you, all the changes, the healing, everything that God's going to do in you. Put thy raiment upon thee, you clothe yourself, get thee down the floor, make not thyself known unto the man till he's done with the eating and the drinking. And they were supposed to wait for him. And that's when he, of course, then, he, after that, uh, then that was when um, she said all that he says, I'll do. And it, he went down there and she did all these things. And when Boaz, Boaz had finished all this, and that's when she, he saw that she was laying at his feet and if you remember from when we talked about in the past, he said, uh, who are you? He says, I'm Ruth, thy handmaid. And so he said, spread therefore thy skirt over thine handmaid. Remember what that is. That's a marriage proposal to be married because I'm a near kinsman. And so she met the conditions for that because 
She had done what was necessary. She got washed, she got anointed, and she put on the garments, the raiment. That's what has to happen to be ready for the marriage. And this also is pointing towards, prophetically, towards the end of the age, because in Ruth 2.23, Remember, she was out in the field before this. If you don't remember this, you ought to listen to the message on Ruth. The, she was out in the field ministering. And that speaks of the church out there ministering. She kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean, out there gathering the harvest in, ministering to people, until the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest. The barley harvest was the, the early harvest when the Israelites, the ones who are of the Old Testament, got born again, remember? And then the wheat harvest is the church age harvest. But it's also interesting that when does the barley harvest really end? It doesn't end until after three and a half years of the tribulation. Because remember that the Jews are going to hear the gospel for the last three and a half years. And so the end of the barley harvest and the end of the wheat harvest is going to be at the time at the end of the tribulation and that of course is when this marriage is going to occur when we are caught up to meet the Lord in the air and we're going to be going up to heaven for the marriage supper of the Lamb and we're going to be the church is going to be married to Jesus that is going to be where you and I are headed towards so we're going to be with him and then we're going to be of course who are the ones that called the chosen and the faithful ones, and we're going to come back with him and then be ruling and reigning with him after the judgment comes on the nations, and we're going to be ruling and reigning with him for the thousand years, the millennial reign. Well, she, made, she did what was necessary. That's what you and I must do. We must get clean, wash clean, get anointed, get God's clothes on. That's why you need the Word in you. The Word in you is a key. Hearing and doing the Word, letting this total work be accomplished in your life, so then you'll be ready for, as it was in that Ruth meeting Boaz, and being ready for the marriage. And that's all type of the church being ready for Jesus coming back to catch us up to meet him in the air. God is going to do a tremendous work in your life. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 10. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces, out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king, and exalt the horn of his, horn is the emblem of power and might, of his anointed. Well, he's going to do that, of course, with Jesus, but he's also going to do that for anybody who is a king. That's you and I, our kings. You and I, he gives strength to the king, and he is going, we're going to have power and might of the ones who are his anointed, because what's the anointing going to do? It's going to teach you the word. It's the Holy Spirit's going to take it and write it in your heart, write it in your mind. You're going to become a holy vessel of God through, this, through the anointing of God that is working in you to bring forth what God purposes. And all the adversaries are going to be broken in pieces, because God's, this is talking about when his judgment comes on the earth. But he's going to give strength to the king and exalt, exalt the horn of his anointed. And that's all also pointing towards you and I because we're going to be with him, remember? Because we are going to be those who have overcome, become full of power, have strength. Remember what it said in Hagehi about being strong and working? Those are the ones who are going to be ready for that, that outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the glory of God that's going to be great, greater than the former church. It tells us to be strong. You're going to get the same strength. See, you're becoming like Jesus. The work of God's to be done in you to bring you to the place of becoming like Him. You're going to be strong and full of might and full of power. You're going to operate in authority. You're going to rule and reign over all your enemies. You're going to get cleansed. You're going to come to the place of being without reproach. You're going to, you're going to make this body's going to be presented holy. You're not going to let sin in the camp. You're not going to have any kind of evil stuff in you whatsoever. It all has to go, everything. This anointing is going to come upon you and it's going to prepare you for all the things that are coming as well because all these things are going to come. Now, also, a couple more things before we stop for this morning. 1 Samuel, 
well, Second Samuel, we'll look at Second Samuel chapter 5, that is. The anointing would come upon those who were a king. Second Samuel 5, 3. So the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron, and King David made a league with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel. Kings get anointed. You are a king. You are now kings and priests, remember, unto God, and you are, um, the anointing is to be operating on you. And what do, what do they do? What do kings do? They rule and reign. What are you to do? You're to do the same thing. You've now been given authority, and you're to rule and reign over all of the enemies. Now, when the anointing's upon you, some people think that, well, I, everything ought to be fine. I shouldn't have any more problems. Not so. David's the king. What happened? Verse 17, when the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, oh, we've got this anointed king now. All the Philistines came up to seek David, and David heard of it and went down to the hold, or the stronghold here. Well, that shows you that the enemies, they came up against him when they heard that the anointing was upon him. Meaning, and why is the anointing come upon you? Because you've met all the conditions. You got born again, you got the Holy Spirit, you're getting the revelation, you're getting the light of the gospel, you're going through the cleansing process, you're putting on the garments of God, you got the fruitfulness that's come in your life, all these things that we've seen, that we got the word, you're putting the word first place, you got that light in you, you're walking uprightly, you come to the place of being upright before him. Well, here, the devils are going to still come after you. When they see the anointing, they're going to try to come after you and try to bring destruction against you. Well... Should that ever happen? No. We're going to conquer everything that comes. What happened? They came and spread themselves against them. David inquired the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Will you deliver in my hand? That's what they did in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we already know that they've already been delivered in our hand because we're already seated in heavenly places together with him. We're already in authority. The Lord said to David, Go up, for I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. And he came up, and what did he do? He smote them all. And the Lord has broken all the enemies before him. He destroyed the whole group. You're a king. If you have gone through what's necessary to see the anointing of God manifest in your life, you conquer everything that comes at you. And don't think they won't come at you. They will come after you. The devils will test you. The devils will try you. The devils will try to come at you. You're an enemy. You're marked. But you have authority and dominion. You can conquer everything. David smote them and destroyed them. Well, oh, okay, I got rid of them once. Everything now should be fine. No. Verse 22, the Philistines came up yet again. I just wiped out these enemies. Now I got them coming again at me. <laughs> did Jesus have a lot of attacks? You better believe he did. Did Paul have a lot of attacks? And he had a tremendous anointing upon him because he met all the conditions to do what was right. But God delivered him out of them all. And the more that you, of course, he had to learn, remember, his authority. For a while, he was seeking for the Lord to get rid of, the, you know, Paul's thorn, until he finally understood that he had authority and dominion, and he started taking it to the enemy and conquering them all. As you learn to take authority and conquer every enemy in your life, you're going to come to the place of total victory. The Philistines came again. Well, doesn't, if they keep coming, you keep smiting. You keep staying on the offensive and do not back off. Do not run away. Do not think, oh, maybe God doesn't want me to deal with this. Now, that's a lying teaching that's gone for. No. You're to conquer everything, in, whether it's in the heavenlies, in your own life, wherever it might be, anything. Any, everything in you is going to come up to come out anyway. You've got to deal with it all. All the evil spirits that are in you, they all need to be cast out. You need to pursue them all and drive them all out. So what did he do? He inquired of the Lord. Shall you go up? Okay, we're going we're gonna to go up. He said, you shall not go up, but fetch a compass against them. And then he says, when you hear the sound of this, he said, you're going to then show the Lord go out before you to smite the host of the Philistines. Otherwise, he had to follow God's directions. Remember, you're not just going to do things presumptuously. You're going to wait for his steps. The steps of the Lord are or steps of the good man, the warrior man are order the Lord. So David did so. You've got to follow his directions. The Lord did command him, smote the Philistines. Wiped them out again. Gathered them all together. These were all the chosen ones as the ones that were responding to the call of God, doing what is right. 
That is what God wants. And he will bring total victory. And in David's Psalm of Thanksgiving, in 2 Samuel 22, verse 51, he said, he's going to give thanks here. He's a tower of salvation for his king. He shows mercy to his anointed. Mercy will be for the anointed. But who's going to be the anointed one? You can shut down the anointing, remember. Just because you have the Spirit of Christ doesn't mean you're going to win every victory or be of the Holy Spirit unless you've met all the conditions for the anointing. If you don't have the mind of Christ, are you going to be able to know what to do? No. If you haven't gone through the cleansing process, are you going to have the anointing to be able to conquer enemies? No. If you haven't got the garments of God on, are you going to walk it in the flesh? No. Even though you have the Spirit of Christ and you have the Holy Spirit in you. See, a lot of people have thought that, well, I got born again. I got the Holy Spirit. I can't understand why these things are coming against me. They're coming against you because the enemies will try to bring destruction against you. But if you walk in all the ways and you do what's necessary to have the anointing of God, the anointing will win the victory all the time. And you will crush all these enemies underfoot. God will give you the victory and bring forth total victory for you. And he'll also, you can come to the place of being protected. Look at this over here in Psalms. 28. Verse 8. The Lord is their strength. This is the word here for might and strength. And he is the saving, delivering, healing, victorious ma'uz. This means place of protection and refuge of who? His anointed. If you've met the conditions to be anointed, he's, he's your strength. You'll be able to deal with everything. He's the one who's going to deliver you, save you, give you victory, bring forth total victory in the place of protection from all your enemies. Otherwise, even though the enemies will attack, you just conquer them all. They don't have to come, they're not going to prevail, prevail against you, you're going to prevail against them. Remember that the, it talks about in the, how, well, how's God going to build his church? It's going to be through the anointing that is operating, remember. Remember what he said in Matthew chapter 16. Thou art Peter, but then he says, upon the rock. And what's the rock? The rock of revelation. Where do you get revelation from? From the word, how? By the Holy Spirit, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit that's going to bring revelation to you and write it in your heart and mind by hearing and doing the word. I'll build my church because you're going to get built up to be a holy habitation for him to come and manifest himself. And the gates of hell will not have strength, superior strength, or be able to overcome it, which is the church. Don't think the enemy can overcome you. If you meet the conditions, you can overcome every enemy because you have total dominion and authority. God wants you to understand. He will give you total victory in all every situation. And we'll look at one last scripture. This, for, this oil is to be, because you're in the Word and you're walking in it, it's to be fresh, continually operating in you. Not just like you had at one moment and where'd it go, you know. No, it's to be abiding in you, this, the anointing and functioning in you continually. Look what he says in Psalms 92.10. But my horn shall be exalted like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Fresh oil. Well, we talk about fresh. This is a, a fresh oil, this anointing that's going to be upon me. It's going to be f fresh oil, flourishing oil, something that's, that's, that's operating in me, fresh or green, luxuriant, in the sense that it's, it's operating continually in your life. That's what he wants. He says, my eye will see, also see my desire on my enemies, because the anointing is going to destroy every enemy. Mine ears shall hear my desire, the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree, and he's going to grow like a cedar in Lebanon, because you're met in the con met meeting the conditions of being righteous. Those planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of our God. That's because you have built the spiritual house, see? And you'll be bringing forth fruit in old age. They'll be fat and flourishing. 
You're, that's what God wants. He wants you to be flourishing because the anointing of God has done its work in your life and done a tremendous work to bring forth everything that he purposes. And God will do a great work in you. But you've got to meet all the conditions. If you meet all the conditions, he'll accomplish this total work in your life. I said that was the last one, but we do have to look at one more because you've got to realize the anointing will break every yoke of bondage, every yoke of bondage. There's nothing that it won't break because it's the manifestation of the presence of God. Isaiah 10, 27, will come to pass in that day as burden will be taken away from off the shoulders, yoke from off the neck, and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the, the anointing. It will be destroyed because of the anointing of God that's operating in you and through you. Jesus had the anointing of God, went forth healing the sick, delivering, casting demons out, seeing people set free, and ministering it to others. The anointing of God will come in and change you in every area of your life. It'll do a total work in you, and then it's going to flow through you to others. And this is what's going to happen in the end time glorious church that has gone on to perfection, that is going to have this mighty anointing that is going to go forth and accomplish the things that he purposes. The anointing is, again, when you think of what's, what, how, what's the definition of the anointing, it really very simply is God manifest in spirit in some way in your life, starting with getting a new spirit, born again, spirit of Christ, then the Holy Spirit, and each, each thing that, where God's manifest is going to carry out the work, and the Holy Spirit now is going to bring revelation, he's going to write the word in your heart and mind, you're going to be putting on the garments of God, you're going to be doing all your part to meet for the anointing, remember, they had to do all their part to see that anointing work in their life, the cleansing has to come forth, come into the place of perfection. This total work, this is the understanding of the anointing. It's not just some thing that's just there, oh, now this is like here. You can shut it down, you can destroy it or hinder it, you can block it by disobedience, and it doesn't automatically. Why does someone seem to be have a, a boy, they, the anointing of God's really working in their life? Look at all the things God's done, and the other hasn't seen hardly anything, even though they're both born again and have the Holy Spirit and speak in tongues, you know. I mean, some people have this attitude that if I'm born again, have the Holy Spirit speak in tongues, I've arrived. <laughs> no, that's just the entrance. That's just the beginning. <laughs> now, you can start seeing God do the tremendous work. That's supposed to happen from day one, see. Then you see this tremendous work. The anointing of God will change you. It will accomplish everything in your life. It's God's presence manifest in all ways. And he wants that in you. So he accomplishes the tremendous work that he's going to do in the body of Christ, in your life. He gets you ready for the marriage. Get you ready for the end times. Get you ready to overcome when the one world order comes on the scene. Because you're gonna have to be filled up with the things of God and you can't be moved by anything that's gonna be coming at you. Say this, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father I thank you and praise you for the anointing of God. God manifest in spirit, in multiple ways, in my life. I thank you that I got born again. I got the Spirit of Christ. The Anointed One came into me, the new spirit. Then I received the Holy Spirit, the further anointing, who comes to teach me and to lead me and to guide me and to do the work in my life. I thank you that I am going to meet the conditions for seeing the anointing manifest in me, just as it was manifest in the tabernacle, meeting the conditions, it's going to be manifest in me, having met the conditions. I will get rid of all leaven, because I must be unleavened. I will get the mind of Christ. I will go through the cleansing process. I will become fruitful. By doing the word, I will be a Nazarite, separate from everything that is not of God. I will walk in all the ways of the Lord. I will have the fragrance of Jesus manifest in me because of the anointing, the manifest presence of God. I will conquer all enemies. 
and I will see the work of God accomplished in my life to heal me, to deliver me, to set me free, and to bring me to the place of meeting, meeting the conditions for the service of the Lord so the anointing can flow forth out of me to minister to others. I thank you. I am going to do what's necessary to see the anointing, the manifest presence of God operate in my life in spirit to accomplish the total work that I'm going on to perfection and the glory of God, the manifest presence is going to come into my life and I'm going to see God bring me to perfection and be a vessel for Him to flow through in these last days to see people one to the Lord. I thank you for that great anointing that I'm going to allow it to work in my life. I will put on the garments of God. I'm putting off everything that would contaminate me. The anointing, God's presence manifest in me will have its way to accomplish everything in my life because I'm a hearer and a doer of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. We talked about this, and we'll talk about more. We have more to talk about this evening as we go through. We haven't even gotten to the New Testament scriptures much. Father, we thank you for all that you brought forth. Thank you for everyone understanding the anointing and seeing what, what was going on in the Old Testament, when all, what was necessary for the anointing and what was being anointed and how it relates to us today, how this work is to be accomplished in spirit within us. We thank you. It is being done. It will be accomplished. Thank you for us all hearing and doing the word. So we see the total work of this anointing in our life and through us for the service of the Lord. Thank you for all that you're accomplishing. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God.